It's a terrible thing, war. Sir, the meeting yesterday gave consideration to your letter stating you are not prepared to approve the scheme for the provision of a surround at the entrance of the Bethnal Green tube shelter. The iron railings of Bethnal Green Gardens link up with two brick pillars at either side of the entrance and the structure between consists of a double wooden gate and a small wicket gate at the side. The committee are aware, in the light of past experience, that there is a grave possibility that on a sudden renewal of heavy enemy air attack there would be an extremely heavy flow of persons seeking safety in the tube shelter and that the pressure of such a crowd of people would cause the wooden structure to collapse and a large number would be precipitated down the staircase. I am directed to add that in the event of the proposals again being rejected the committee cannot accept any responsibility for the consequences which may th therefore ensue. I am, sir, your obedient servant, S.P. Ferdinando, 30th of September, 1941. By early 1943, we'd been at war with Germany for three and a half years. The Blitz was long over. Our kids had come back to London. Bombing raids, the way we'd seen them, were a thing of the past, but we still needed the shelters. These things still happened. What with the war on that, They'd stopped building this new central line on the underground. Bethnal Green was only half finished. It had one entrance, and from the ticket hall you had two sets of stairs running next to each other down to the platforms. When the war started, shelters were made so that people living nearby or on the streets could be in a shelter within seven minutes. About the end of 1940, people started demanding sleeping accommodation that they could occupy throughout the blackout time and in October Bethnal Green became one of East London's largest community shelters. A couple of years later, yeah, though, and that's eased off. The size of the entrances wasn't really thought about anymore. The thing is, at Bethnal Green, the entrance was wider than the staircase, so it acted like a funnel. Unlike some of the other underground stations, Londoners would still pack into light after night just to be on the safe side, we didn't have no trains running through, so we had bunk beds running right into the tunnels. We had thousands of people who could come in and shelter. You could register for a bunk and buy a ticket for the night. Bring your bed in, don't leave your valuables in the house. And Bob's your uncle. You couldn't get away from the smell though, it's all over the place. The chemical toilets at the bottom of the escalators are sort of smell of carbolic. Kids would know each other from school, they'd race about and the adults would be saying, you know, what are you up to? You're going to knock everybody over. But that kids are kids, they liked it. Some people would live nearby and they'd go down two or three times a week. Others, they virtually lived there. You had to get there early to get the bunks. But once they'd gone, that was it. Some people had regular places. The men would stand at the side, then the platform would get full up, and then the entrance to the platforms. Once you got a spot, that was it that was where you were. The kids didn't go wandering off when it was full, they had to stay with their parents. They'd go swapping comics and telling stories, some of the girls would do some knitting. If someone went off to get a drink or something, they'd leave the kids with the other grown-ups. Everyone was safe down there because everybody knew everyone else. The only time people would get frightened was when they could hear the sound of the bombs. It didn't bother the kids so much, but if you could hear the bombs then you knew that something up top wasn't going to be the same when all the clear sounded. The bunks went right the way out of the tunnels in either direction for quite a distance. There are red lights down the middle of the tunnel which we dim at 11 o'clock so people get a good night's sleep. Well, as good of a night's sleep as you can have in that sort of situation. The next morning people would pick up their bundles and go to work, unless you were one of the mothers who got their heads around the idea of living underground for most of the time. There were loads of things down there, you know. It had become a community. We had a library and a doctor's surgery and a chapel with a priest who used to come in. We had a little theatre down there too. Entertainers came in to sing or play the piano and we had held drama nights, even weddings and Christmas parties. Someone might come round selling hot food. We made the best out of things that we could. But it could be grim down there. This was a war. I mean, they weren't going down the shelter for the fun of it. They'd be lining up outside early to make sure they'd got a place. Every night it would happen. That's a lot of time people spent just hanging around to queue up top. 
people would run down the escalators to get their place. If the signs went off, people would run as fast as they could, and they did run. But they still queued. No pushing in. People were used to it. They were patient. The doors closed when the sirens ended. If you got down in time, there was no having to wait once you got down to the platforms. We knew some of the regulars were, and we'd held their places for them. Some families had their bunks already allocated. Now, the staircase. It was never supposed to be the entrance to an air raid shelter. It was supposed to be the entrance to a tube station. It wasn't properly built. It was on an angle, on the opposite side of the road to St John's Church, where Roman Road meets Cambridge Heath Road. The steps weren't finished. They were rough concrete. They had a bit of a wooden tread attached, but there was a slight overlapping bit on some of them. Edges of the concrete could break off. Now, if you get hundreds of people trying to get down there at the same time... Earlier during the war, great pools of water were collected at the bottom of the stairs when it rained and some Charlie had to sweep it all away. It wasn't really safe. That's why the cover was put on the top, to stop the rain making the stairs slippery. It didn't solve things, but it made them a bit better. There was a wicket gate at the top and a set of double doors which opened onto the staircase and the stairs were at an angle to the entrance. Now these gates, well, they weren't really much stronger than what you'd get on a shed, to be honest. They wouldn't really keep out a stampede of people. Not that we'd expect that. Bethnal Green people, they know how to behave. We might have had no money, but we had our heads screwed on. And that is what the town clerk kept asking the civil defence people several times a couple of years before. The entrance isn't safe. It needs to be sorted out. Something could happen. Something could happen. But every time it was, you don't need it. There's more important things to spend the money on. It's safe to strengthen the doors. And the town clerk would go back to them. It's not safe. Come and have another look. We need a proper door. Brick walls and a crash barrier. It's a disaster waiting to happen. No, mate, it's safe. We've had a look. Sort the doors out and that'll stop people rushing in and causing an accident. But no. So they stopped asking. Civil Defence weren't interested. I mean, they weren't going to help. Oh, yeah, throw a couple of quid at the problem, make it look like you care. Say no enough times, the problem's going to disappear. And it did. But not forever. When the entrance got covered over, it made it dark inside, so you were going down a flight of badly made stairs in the dark and coming in at an angle. There's a blackout on, so you can't go putting up proper lights. There'd been things like hurricane lamps by the doors, but people had gone smashing or nicking them. Bloody idiots. So we had a little bulkhead light set above the stairs. Just a 25 watt bulb. That's all it had. That's nothing. And the lamp housing was painted up so it only let out a little slim, dim blue light which hit the first steps as you came in. You could look at that if there was no one in front, but then you'd be going down in the dark. Now, if there's no one pushing you and you've got knowledge of the place, you might get through all right. Through the door, anger yourself to the right a bit, and then you go down. 19 steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. On to the first landing. Then there's a square landing with another set of six steps on a right angle off it going down into where the book and all was going to be. It's all still pretty dimly lit. You can't have any light being seen by the enemy aircraft. There's no handrails in the middle of the staircase and it's wide. And if you twist your ankle or something, then unless you're at the side and can steady yourself, you're going to trip and you're probably going to fall and hurt yourself. Even if you fall at the side, you might still get grazed by the unfinished walls. But you see, that wasn't important to the civil defence people. As long as you can get down in the shelter, and it's only a couple of steps, and you're going to be safe from the bombs, but, but they weren't there. They didn't see what we saw every night. The danger was there that something bad might happen. I mean, you go down there to be safe. They sorted it out afterwards. It's too late then. Someone from the London County Council tried to get into the shelter at night with a baby a few months before it happened. He had to feel for each step with his feet. He told the local chief warden the place was a death trap. In January 1943, a door to the shelter proper had been shut whilst people were still coming down the stairs during an air raid. I reckon on the night that all it all kicked off, 
a lot of the people up top thought it had happened again. We used to have a chief, shelter warden, deputy, 12 full-time wardens and women wardens. That night there was the chief, the deputy, two wards in the main shelter and four near the top. And three of us were part-timers. On the night, we had one between the entrance at the bottom of the stairs, two men helping the people down the main escalator and one stationed by the office door to relay messages. There would have been more, but the sirens hadn't gone off yet. There's one old fella. He comes down the shelter most nights, but he's unsteady on his feet and the escalator down to that main shelter is more than he can manage, so he sits himself on his chair at the bottom of the stairs leading in. Sits where the booking hall's going to be. On the 1st of March, the RAF dropped tons of bombs over Berlin. Now, we knew that when something like that happened, the Germans was going to do something back. And we suffered in the East End. Easy for them to reach and close to the docks, but it hardly ever came straight away. It would usually be two or days later. Some people were worried. More than usual came into the shelter on March the 2nd, but people were ready for the bombs coming on Friday the 3rd. And it was rotten weather that night. It was cold and it was raining. A rain that went right through your clothes and kept you cold. I'm still a bit shaky. Doctor said my oldest should go out to work. She was sitting at home brooding over it. There's a broadcast relay in the building which gives you a warning six or seven minutes before the alert sounds. The relay says stand by for a spatial announcement. I know what that means. You make your way to the tube. Round about five to eight, the radio just went dead. Boom. We knew then there was going to be an air raid. This night, my father said to me and Aunt Lil, you make your way to the shelter and I'll fetch mum and the baby. My sister was just three weeks old at that time. We went to the museum picture house. Went to see Abbott and Costello. Halfway through, they put the house lights up and notice came on the screen saying, if you want to leave, leave now. It was about two or three minutes walk to the shelter, but we used to run. Some couldn't run as quick. They'd stop for a while, then they'd run. They'd run as fast as they could. It was just after eight o'clock. My mum gave a funny little nervous cough and said, right, come on. And we got our bundles, our blankets and pillows, and, and we got round the junction of the Aberdeen, and the number eight bus had just gone, and my mum wasn't happy at all about that, so we had to wait for the next one to come along. We got off the bus at the tube, and it was normal. People queuing up and talking, and it was moving on, and more and more buses was coming, and people getting off. We got down to the tube, and it was a horrible night. It was raining, and it was cold, and it was pitch black because we got the blackout on. Suddenly up went the searchlights crossing and all that, but there was no planes about. The signs went off at 8.17 p.m. It was dark, but the sky was full of searchlights just after that happened. The shelter door was open, but no one was manning the entrance. There used to be a policeman when the bombing was heavy, but because they'd been conscripted, there wasn't many raids. We hadn't really had one at the top for nearly two years. Four of us were in the booking hall. None of us were higher up, so we couldn't see what eventually happened. There's nothing we could have done to stop it happening, even if we had. One. Opposite the tube entrance, there was a little group of five or six people Four. talking. Five. Apart from that, it had been quiet. Eight. We walked up Old Nine. Fall Road, and then the air raid sirens started. We reached Victoria Park Square, and the searchlight in Bethnal Green Gardens came on. It was radio controlled to go straight onto the planes. By the time the searchlight had come on, we knew that it was time to move. We was running down Victoria Park Square wanting to see the entrance to the tube. It couldn't come up fast enough. You knew the anti-aircraft guns was going to start. I said, come on Aunt Leo, the guns is going to start. We got to the station, but still the guns hadn't fired. There was no panic. People was going down as oddly as anything. Ladies and gentlemen helping each other. We could see the flashes of the guns. No bombs. This lady and her daughter were behind us in the cinema. They walked and the daughter was killed in it because they walked and we ran One, and there was loads three, of bangs my mother and aunt three, thought it was bombs so that's when we all ran as we started to go down there was a lady with a baby in her arms i could see a white shawl on the opposite side there was an older man with a cap on they're both leaning against the wall i think to guide them just past them there was a lot of noise a lot of guns too much it was different from the times before 
There's no bombs falling. There was miles away. Oh, listen, there was miles away. This particular day, when I entered the tube, it was very dull. The stairs were very wide. Funny enough, my mother always said there's going to be an accident here because it was so dark. Anyway, I went down the stairs, got to the escalator, and I'm walking down and I'm looking back. There was nobody following me, nobody at all. I finished going down the stairs to see my mother. There wasn't a panic before. People going down the stairs were orderly, they were just coming down quicker than usual because of the circumstances. I reckon those reports of panic were due to get civil defence off the hook, what the government wanted to hear. There was an anti-aircraft rocket battery in Victoria Park, not that far from the shelter. Victoria Park was approved for a Z battery back in 1941. By now they're all over the country. There wasn't any any air aid on Bethnal Green that night. One bob did fall in Poplar, but that's miles away. There's anti-aircraft rockets going off in Victoria Park with just normal rockets going off against the bombing range like there were everywhere else. The noise was different to the noise made by the guns during the Blitz and some people only just come back from evacuation and they weren't familiar with the sound they made. The rockets went off in a salvo with a roar like a train speeding through a station. There'd be an orange flash, the masses of red dots shooting up into the sky and then huge explosions. We got to the middle of the staircase and there was a terrific noise. The tubes filled with a propeller were four feet long and they were dangerous as they came back to Earth. One of them sounded different, it was faulty, it hadn't been primed properly, it didn't go up as high as it was meant. It came down like a big drain pipe, it was noisy, it was really noisy. We was all quietly queuing up and moving along and suddenly there was a horrendous noise, I can still hear it, it went right through your ears. It was like hundreds of rockets going up into the air and they went up and up and up and they whistled like the bombs used to as they came down. There always used to be a policeman there, but there wasn't that night. There was me mum, me and my sister's friend Dolly. Her mum was down there and she said, come with me, my mum's going to be worried about me. I said, no, you keep with your mum, I'm going to stay with mine. There's this great big bang. No one knew where it come from. It's really loud, frightened everyone. I was frightened. I saw people all running over the tube from Roman Road, Cambridge Road, up from Whitechapel. I looked up Bethnal Green Road, it was full of buses. All stopped, she pulled me skirt and said, come on. I said, no, you go over there. She wanted to go there because she was so frightened. She was worried, her mum was worried about her. I got over halfway down the first staircase. I was on the left. There was an old woman on the right of the stairs. She was carrying a baby. I don't know what happened. I don't know if she tripped or she got pushed with the people coming up behind her, but she got to the third step from the bottom and she fell forward. A man standing just behind her fell on top of her. Some children at her One, side fell straight three, afterwards. Three, Everybody just leapt forwards. Get down, get down, there's bombs, there's bombs. Those of us on the staircase tried to walk down quicker, but the people behind us pushed us down. Me and my aunt, we, we just got carried down in the surge of the people and got split up. And then people started to fall around around me. I got down to the end and I was wedged against the wall on the left and there was people falling. As I fell, I was still going down. I grabbed the handrail and kept pushing myself upright. I was trapped and I couldn't move and I just kept on screaming, get me out, get me out, mom, mom, now, dad. I was 13 and I was screaming for my mother, screaming hard. They were building up all around me, but I couldn't move my legs. I tried to claw myself out, but I couldn't move. We got about halfway down the stairs in the middle. I couldn't go no further. I wanted to get out, but I couldn't. So I put my hands in front of me and I curled up into a ball. It was just crushing and crushing. Pete was just pushing and pushing. I, I could feel them pushing all around me. I was losing my breath, crushing them in front and behind as well. Crushing us all. Don't know how long I was there for. I was on my hands and knees. I can remember hanging on to my sister's coat and we got near to the top of the stairs. I tripped over something. I don't know what it was, but my sister grabbed me and someone pulled us out. There was this heat coming up from down the stairs. It was absolutely horrible. 
There was a woman near us, at the top, with five kiddies. When the rocket went off, they all got picked up off the ground and with their, at their feet touching the floor, they was near the bottom of the steps in a few seconds, upside down. There was a lot of shouting and screaming. A lot of the people was jammed in there who, who couldn't move. People were shouting, stop pushing, stop pushing. It sounded like a gun went off. Someone shouted, there's a landmine. I put one foot on the step and after that, no more. Before we knew where we were, we were flung down the staircase. Our feet didn't touch the ground. I was right in the middle of the staircase in the old crush. Before I knew where I was, I could not turn or move or do a thing. Everyone was on top of me and I could not turn around because there was people there. I just could not turn and look behind me. People in front. We didn't know there was a crowd there. I just thought you was going down the shed of the usual way and it was dark. You thought we were going to walk down as you always did. I felt people across the staircase and when I was in that crowd with my mother and my mother was at the side of me, I had everything squeeze from inside of me. I was screaming for help. And by the time I turned around and looked for my mother, I found her head going. I saw a mouth then I saw her head fall back. I tried to get my lips to her to breathe some life into her, but I couldn't. I turned to the front and everyone was calling out, go forward or go back. He just didn't know where you were. I saw my mother was dead, but she was standing in the old time because I was old enough. My feet weren't even on the ground. I had this curtain all the time and I was so hot I couldn't even move my hand to undo a button. Hundred and seventy one. Hundred and seventy two. Hundred and seventy three. There were people lying in a solid block on the floor. They were crying and screaming, some were muttering praise. I thought the pressure would ease, but it got worse. I managed to get upright, but soon had to fight for my breath. I never thought I'd survive, but somehow I found myself able to move. I tried to drag a baby out, but it was suffocated. There were people in there whose limbs had been broken by sheer weight. This woman who fell first, some lady was trying to pull her out, but she couldn't, so she told her to stay where she was and she'd be alright. I was standing at the top of the escalator and the crowd were passing normally. A man and his daughter came down and said, what's it like up there? And the man said, it's bad. We stood talking for a minute and I saw the crowd had thinned out a little, then I heard a call for help. I yelled to ask what was going on, then I ran round where I heard the call, up the first flight of stairs to the land, and all I saw was just a mass of people on top of one another, struggling, and a mass coming down the stairs. The man in the booking all followed me round. I said, no, mate, no, don't go up there. There's trouble up there. Take the girl down. I went downstairs. When the warning sounded, I went up the main entrance to see it was open. I stood there a while as people came in. After a few minutes, I went down into the booking hall to see if there was anybody hanging about. There shouldn't be anyone down there. i have been back down there for four or five minutes when I heard screams and shouts. I rushed up to the landing. Dozens of people were falling and it was all a tumble. I stood there for a second and I couldn't realise what was happening. It was so quick. The only thing I could do was shout, for God's sake, keep back, let them get up. One of the men in the crush joined in and yelled, don't push, go back. But he got swamped and started yelling about his head and his back being crushed. We had a try to pull some people out, but it was hopeless. They was all interlocked. Now, if you're falling, it's your instinct to put your arms to cushion your fall. But in the pitch dark, people didn't know which way they was falling. And all these arms and legs got intermingled and wrapped around each other. They reckon within 30 seconds, 300 people were trapped from the ground to the ceiling. With brute force, we pulled out half a dozen babies. People were tearing at me arms to get out. I saw a woman and a couple of men roll down over the pile and managed to get out. It in a matter of seconds. I tried to drag more bodies off the top, but I was a fawn. It was impossible, so I ran round and phoned to order a call to the police from the booking hall. I said we needed 50 at least. I don't know what they thought had happened, maybe they thought it was a fight or something. I got a few people down the escalators and I went back. Once the police were called, all we could do was try and alleviate the distress of the people crying out. We ended up crying out in desperation ourselves, we couldn't get more people out. It was the worst four hours of agony I've ever had. And I was in Dunkirk. I managed to get three kiddies out though. Two were rather hurt. I shone a torch out to see how bad things were and someone shouted to turn it off. People were piled up in a mass of five feet and people falling on top of them right the way from the back. And there was screaming, you've killed my baby, you've broken my arm. 
I gave some water to a woman whose head was over the bottom step. Then I saw a woman nearby who was holding her baby up. She was passing out. I dived over the top of the people and yelled, hey, if you're going to die, lady, give me your baby. Other people were trying to pull these people out and they were working like Trojans. Women were screaming, babies crying, everybody struggling desperately to get out. The weight of the pressing mass was tremendous. I was lifted off my feet and nearly had my arms broken. The cloven of women and men was torn to shreds in the struggle. I shouted in the hope of calming people and relieving the pressure, but nobody took any notice. Women were trying to protect their babies by crouching over them. We were all passing out because there was no air, because the entrance was blocked. All the people were piling up, it was so hot. And they put water hoses in that over us to revive us. I was panicking, and this lady air raid warden, Miss Chumley, first of all she grabbed my hair thinking I'd come out, but I didn't, and I screamed even louder. Then she laid across the bodies, put her arms under mine and yanked me out like a bag of rubbish. I scraped my legs against the jagged wall, but at least I came out. I felt my feet dragging over people's faces. When she got me out and she put me on the landing, she put her finger in my face and she said to me, you go downstairs and you say nothing, nothing at all what is happening here. Do you hear me? I went down crying. I pressed the bell and the door opened. He said, what's the matter, son? And I, I was so frightened I didn't say anything. I just wandered off and sat on my bunk. Ten minutes later, Aunt Lil arrived. She'd been told to stay quiet too. Her stockings had been torn off and her black astrakhan coat and shoes was lost. It was a different era. You didn't ask questions, you said nothing. When you were a boy, you just shut it. We didn't realise people was missing. We were about the last dozen people to get down there. No one's coming behind us. No one at all. Nobody knew the reason for it. My sister said something bad's happened. They're not coming down now. So a man came along and said, can we have some assistance? There's been an accident upstairs. All of a sudden, there was policemen, firemen and warders rushing through the tube. So I said to my mother, there's something wrong. Everybody's rushing around. I'm going to the top to find out what the trouble is. I went to the top and they said, you can't go out, you go back. So I had to go back. I went up again and I still couldn't get out and nobody knew what was happening. We was there till five o'clock the next morning. Nobody knew what was happening. My sister was one of the last to get stuck. She got pushed onto the top of the pile. In the dark, all she could think was how soft it was. She had no idea she was lying on top of a pile of people that was dead and dying. Then I remember people coming down carrying children, eight, ten years old above their heads. There's one boy I knew, I didn't know his name, but I knew him from looking. Two men came carrying him. His face was mauve. I moved everyone out of the way then. No one could see, no one knew what had happened. We didn't know what was going on outside. People started coming in from the tunnels. They, they're coming through a special entrance in Colton Square. They ran up from the inside. Outside, there was three fellows holding hands in a bunch around the crowd by the stairs. The first policeman to arrive came about a quarter of an hour after it happened. He'd been half a mile away. And no one arrived until well after it happened. He should have got there in half the time, but it wouldn't have made much difference. People were already dead. One policeman against that, what could he have done? People were still trying to get in and others were yelling at them, don't go down there, don't go down there, come with me to the arches, behind the salmon and ball, or, or come with me to me mum's house. This policeman was calling out, they want some help here. They stopped all the traffic along Bethnal Green Road and they got all the men, women and teenagers to hold hands and make a great big ring of people. And that was to stop the traffic. Then more police arrived and other units, some of them only kids, and they were trying to pull people out from the top because it was too tightly packed at the bottom. There was a young, young lad who, who crawled down over the bodies, saying sorry to the people he was treading on. He was testing for a pulse and then helping to get them out. I never saw men work better. My dad had gone with me down a few steps. The people pushing behind him made him decide to throw me. He had no choice. Next thing I remember is this man saying, you're all right, you're all right. It was just like a day, she had to stay there, there was all these people screaming and crying, it was all confusing, just wondering when it was going to stop, I had to stay with this man. People at the bottom are getting pulled out away from the wall around the corner. They were asking everyone if they were all right and then they got sent down to where the beds were. Some people had been thrown babies to took them to the first aid place. 
They're starting to move all the bodies. We didn't know they were dead. They're pulling out Pete from the top, and when we dad, they put him in the gutter because they thought he was dead, but they got his mirrors out to see if he was still breathing. Dad was crushed on the ways down. They took him to Bethnal Green Hospital. They saved his life. This man took me upstairs, and they were slaying bodies all along the pavement. Tom was waiting in the other air raid shelter to do all clear with I'd got stunned by a knock from someone and lost my footing. I got one arm free and managed to turn a little. I could see the police were pulling people out from the top and eventually they got to me. Mothers were found crouching over their children trying to protect them. A lot of those children couldn't be recognised apart from their clothes or their shoes. The last I saw of my wife was when she was carried out by a rescue worker. I toured the hospitals for hours trying to find her but without success. I didn't know whether she was alive. I'd had my youngest daughter with me and we got her to the first aid post across the street. She was already dead. The next morning we found out we'd lost another daughter. One side of her face had been crossed by a boot. We didn't know there'd been an accident, so we saw the dead bodies coming out on stretchers. All of a sudden we were standing there, I went forward to the corner without telling me mum and dad. I saw these ARP men coming out with stretchers, and on them was dead people. Little boys, great big sailors, family lived in my mum's buildings. That man, great big tall fit, he was home on leave, he died. Couldn't even save himself. Laid them all in rows outside the Salmon and Ball pub. What I saw, men, women, children, some as young as five or six, where they'd been squashed in the... Can't say. When Dad got older, me, covered me eyes, he said to me, you don't want to see that. We were sent over to the shelter at the Salmon and Bull pub underneath the railway arch. My sister sat me down and said, you sit there. I don't know what had happened to our mum and my sister was going around asking people. Somebody said... Well, go into that room and see if she's in there. And my 16-year-old sister had to go into this room and look at all these dead bodies, but she wasn't in there. She'd been pulled out and taken to the church across the road. All the bodies were lying right the way down. I up to get some of the youngsters up. About seven and eight years old, I took them out and we laid them outside on blankets. We went down to pick up a few more. Little babies. Two years old year old and the ambulances started coming but there wasn't enough to deal with what had happened the people had been caught up they went to the london hospital in whitechapel bethnal green hospital and they took a lot to the queen elizabeth as well it was a mix of the living and the dead to begin with as a serving member of the london ambulance service stationed in wilmot street bethnal green i was an attendant on the first ambulance to arrive at the scene of the disaster Neither the driver nor myself had any idea what to expect, and we were both horrified when our first four casualties proved to be four dead bodies. Our second run was a similar journey to Bethnal Green Hospital with four dead bodies. This time it was necessary to go into the mortuary to retrieve blankets from the dead, and the sight of a pile of bodies of dead children is a nightmare, not easily forgotten. On our third journey, I had one conscious man who was very disturbed because he did not know what had happened to his wife. By this time the doctors from the hospital were outside certifying the dead who were being taken to St James's the Less where a temporary mortuary hastily set up. At this stage I grabbed a doctor pleading that I had a man who was alive on my ambulance and he was taken into the hospital. Our ambulance station was indeed a sombre place that night. We were particularly appalled that such extensive deaths had occurred when no bombs had been dropped. We wondered how many of the dead children had been brought back to London from the safety of evacuation because of the lull in the bombing. They started bringing in the stretchers with patients on them. The ambulance personnel kept bringing in the casualties. There just wasn't room. They were putting them on the floor. They said, we don't understand this because there was no sign of any injury. No one was crying with pain. There was no blood, no sign of fractures because they'd all been suffocated. Swollen face, swollen lips and very very blue. They weren't all brought in to us because we couldn't cope with them all. Nobody could understand why they should all be dead on arrival. 
Loose clothing was piled up, shoes and, and coats and things, and handbags. We didn't know who they belonged to. I was on duty at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital for Children. A message came through from some central office that we were to expect 30 faints from a tube shelter. I had with me two male students from the London Hospital. We had to prepare the ward and take down the children's cots and put up 30 beds. I said to the men that it was a put-up job, just to see how quickly we could do it. An exercise. To expect 30 faints from that tube shelter was ridiculous. We'd hardly finished when one wet, mauve body was brought in on a stretcher. They put water on them to try and revive them, but they were dead from the beginning. After a few moments of struggling, there is a period of unconsciousness, and that is quite short. Crushing by pinning and suffocation can cause you to pass out in seconds and die in under twenty seconds. It was terribly sad to see on the stretcher there'd be a woman and then there'd be a baby or a small child, all of them dead. A few people did come that we could help, but it wasn't many. A small boy with a broken arm could tell us what had happened. He had climbed over the bodies and climbed back up to the top. I opened the door of the consulting room and said to roll the bodies off onto the floor and give the men the stretchers back. They were agitated and it didn't strike me until later that they were so upset because their women and children were down in the shelter. The senior casualty officer came in and she was absolutely livid and told us we were being disrespectful of the dead and had hysterics and went off duty. So I was in charge of this hopeless situation. Even sister was doing what I said. I shouldn't have been left in that position at all. I was expecting a consultant to turn up, but they didn't. I expect the reason they didn't turn up is because they were all dead. The bodies continued to arrive until about 11 o'clock. It must have been about three hours. The next morning at the hospital, we were sworn to secrecy. They didn't even say thank you, but they told us we could go off duty for 24 hours. And there we were without any support at all, and my reaction was to walk from Bethnal Green to Hammersmith, where my mentor lived. This took me all day. She listened and told me she agreed I shouldn't dare tell anyone else. Those two students were told not to come back again. I never did see them, and, and I felt very sorry because my life had depended on them. The fact that one was told not to tell anybody was a very serious thing. In those days you did what you were told. I didn't attempt to tell anybody, not even my own family. I phoned my mother and told her I'd had a bad day and I was perfectly all right, and to her dying day I never told her what had happened. They shut it off. You couldn't leave there. They let us out about six in the morning. My mum said she was going to be late for work. It was just this mess of kids' shoes and women's scarves on the stairs and pairs of glasses and air grips and socks and ripped clothes with buttons torn off and loads of clumps of air which had been torn off people's heads. Lots of people were waiting about outside. Normally we'd come out and turn left along Cambridge Heath Road but we couldn't turn left because there were six or seven men standing in our way across the pavement and they, they sent us across the road. I looked between them I could see the bodies lined up against the side of the park. We ran home, got indoors, then the air raid warning went again. We all ran the way back to the tube and went back down. I was a centre of attention at school. I've been there when it happened. How we all met up, I don't know, but suddenly we was out in the street and Mum was cuddling us and we started to walk home. I remember walking home and seeing all these people along the pavement and saying to Mum, look all those people laying down there. They're going to get wet. And she said, oh, maybe they're just having a lie down. A policeman lived down our road and he said, go in there and my wife will make you a cup of tea. Whilst he was walking up the road, he met up with my dad, and he'd heard on the wire at work about this terrible accident at Bethnal Green, and he just dropped everything and rushed there, knowing we'd be down there, and he was looking for us, helping to pull the bodies out. When the policeman told him we were safe, he just clacked on the floor. What struck me the most was, well, he was a big man, my dad, and he was crying. I couldn't understand why. I walked about all night looking for Mum. And he and my brother went, there was all these people lying out along where the railings were. They died. A police officer said, try the hospital. 
came home with a bag with my mum's vest and clothing in it and blood and hair all over the vest and stuff and that was the end of her life. My mother looked after this girl, Vera Trotter. At eight o'clock she hadn't arrived. Mum normally took her to school when her mum was at work. Everyone was mystified. People was missing but we just got on with life. My father had pulled a nail from Vera's shoe a couple of weeks before, so at the mortuary he recognised her shoe but her face was unrecognisable. People were identified from their clothes and their shoes. Vera's mother was beside her. When he got home, he sat on the step and cried, I found them. They're both dead. Vera's dad asked for compassionate leave, but he was refused because he had no home to go back to. Afterwards, when the dead was being buried, there was 15 funerals a day. When you see people close to you die, they should have got old, but but they didn't. My dad said, where's Iris and Barbara? We told him we didn't know, so he went to Bethnal Green Hospital. He told him people had died at the tube and they got some of the bodies in St John's Church. So dad went there and found my sister. Came home and my aunt said, did you see Barbara? He said, no, and told me brother Alfie to go and look. He went there and saw a little black pair of shoes. He told him to turn that one over. It was our cousin Barbara. One lady's daughter who got killed, her name was Lottie. They went to see her at the mortuary. She had the ill mark of a man's foot on her throat. Another girl they identified by a ring what her mother brought her for her birthday. That was the only way you knew. That was it. Lots of people you used to see or you knew. It was probably a couple of days later. The AR people were the first to find out because it was one of their own. My mother got in touch with a couple of uncles or something and they went down and identified the body. They wouldn't let me go down saying, remember dad how he was. Over the weekend we thought we was orphans. I knew my father was dead and my grandfather and grandmother was as well, but that time I thought my mother had gone as well. My sister come back all happy, said she'd found her she was still alive. And I got back to school, I remember going into class. My mother gave me a note to take to the teacher. The teacher just looked at it, threw it on the table and said, right, go and sit down. I remember my first reaction going into that classroom was three empty chairs. They was the children that didn't survive. I was so sick after, for months. I couldn't eat and I couldn't walk. I had no strength to do anything. I was carried like a baby, though, though I was nine then. They thought I was gonna... Well, they got my dad home on compassionate leave. I would sit on the windowsill all day. It took about five days. I fell asleep on the window ledge. It was dark when he got home. They woke me up. Dad was here. I got back to normal after that. The official line was that had been directed on the station, that's how everyone was killed, but everyone in the East End knew everything was still there. there wasn't any bomb damage. The paper sent to the story. Seven members of the Mead family, George Senior, Florence, George Junior, Kenneth, Maureen, Eliza, and M, married daughter of Matilda, were caught up in the disaster. Six died in the crash. Maureen was put out alive, but she died in hospital several hours later with a tear in her eye. She was only four years old. Annie Dongray, 22, had only recently been married to a soldier they'd managed to have one weekend together before her husband had to return to the war. After the disaster, he was allowed home and insisted his new wife was to be buried in a wedding dress. May Hutchinson was brought out alive by her husband, a stretcher bearer but her children, Joan and William, died on the stairwell. May couldn't live with the death of her children and took her own life shortly after. She jumped from the roof of the hospital. They had to hold an inquiry. Of course they did. When Herbert Morrison spoke to the cabinet about it, Churchill replied, I am against giving such slime light to this incident. What notice is taken of all those who died in the air attacks? And he didn't want it announced for the morale of the people, it was a civilian thing that had happened. It wasn't through enemy bombing, and it wasn't a fascist plot. These stupid bloody rumours started floating around. Secret fascists had done it. It's as much nonsense as saying it was the Jews that did it. <laughs> oh yeah, 
German radio was saying that. Only 1% of the users of Bethnal Green were Jewish. Bloody rumours. Careless talk. Sir, I have the honour to report that in accordance with your written instruction forwarded to me, I opened an inquiry on the 11th of March into the circumstances of an accident at a London tube station shelter. Eighty witnesses were examined. Given an inspection of the site and the testimony of these survivors and witnesses, I confess surprise that the accident hasn't happened before, and no one, I think, can exclude the possibility of it happening elsewhere. When the sirens went, my wife and I were sitting at home talking. The boy had just gone to bed. As we'd been through the worst of the blitz, my wife was a bit nervous. So the best thing to do, I thought, was to take her to the deep shelters. We got the boy into his clothes and hurried off to the shelters. As we got to the entrance, the guns started to go off. We started down the stairs. After a bit, there's a turning in the stairs, and when we got there, there was quite a lot of people ahead of us. Suddenly, we heard some screaming from above us on the stairs, and the people behind us were commenced to push. In front was a solid mass of humanity, and they didn't give an inch. My wife and I held Roy between us by the hand. I tried to protect him. All of a sudden, the people above me on the stairs, well, they were screaming and crying, and they began to fall on us, and I felt the boy's hand being torn from mine. Roy, I called. I'm all right, Daddy, I heard him say. I couldn't hear anything from my wife. I didn't know how long I lay there with terrible pains in my legs, but they told me afterwards it was an hour. I must have lost consciousness for a bit. After I came to, I was crushed in so badly, I couldn't breathe or think or to do anything but just lie there and hope. About 40 policemen came. Joining hands, they pushed the people back a little and two persons got out from the bottom of the pile. Then they got three more out. Little by little, they eased the crush. I couldn't hear my boy. I didn't know if my wife was alive or dead. Finally, they got me out and took me to a Bethnal Green Hospital. A long time later, I was told my wife was badly bruised and in hospital. Then they came and told me Roy was in the hospital, badly bruised, but nothing broken. There were six lines of people about three deep at the entrance and they were moving in. There was no pushing or rushing about, no fighting or anything like that. It was a bit pushy, not panicky. I began to go down the steps. I was about four or five steps from the bottom of the first flight. I was not taking a lot of notice of anything that was what happening in front of me because the people seemed to be moving down and of course I had my baby in my arms and my boy was hanging on to me hand and the wife was a little bit on the side of me. As I got to the spot where it actually stopped, there seemed to be something in front which actually stopped the crowd. There was the warden, the marshal and about four or five men at the bottom of the steps in that square space before you get to the escalators. They seemed to be holding the the crowd back. There were people shouting, all right, let's get on. The the crowd was trying to slide around the corner on the right, but then the crowd just stopped dead. They all seemed to be jammed in a straight line. People behind them started pushing it was terrific the pushing that the crowd kind of swayed and I was half turned as I was crushed I had my baby in my arms I tried to lift the baby up but of course I got jammed the crowd behind me got more crushed up and some girls started screaming it couldn't have been very long until people began to pass out they began to throw their heads back and flop over nobody fell down because you couldn't fall down. It was impossible to fall down. At the bottom of the steps there was these men and this warden. I saw the people dying and my little boy was crushed into me and I could only feel his head and and the baby. I, I could just see her face and I could see she was trying to breathe. I was trying to lift her out of my arms, lift her up above, but I couldn't do it. My arms were jammed in, I couldn't move them an inch. People around me were going blue in the face, they're all flopping, they're all going out, they're kind of dying. I began to get scared for the baby's sake. I kept on trying to push her up and out to the people down below and I started shouting at this morning, it was just in front of me. I was shouting, you know, to shift the people in front. If he could 
I only have pulled these people away. I was shouting to them, please pull them away. My baby's dying. Those are the words I was shouting. My baby is going. He didn't seem to catch on. He was just shining his torch. He didn't seem to know what he was doing with everybody yelling. And I began to feel right on myself. I began to feel in the crush that I, I, I couldn't breathe properly. I knew the baby had gone. Her pulse had stopped. I could just see the wife on one side of me. She was being overcome. Her head was going back and my little boy, he was still on his feet and standing up to my hip. We were standing on that back to the police came. All the people were dead around me. I was standing on my own then. There's nobody around me. I could see they're all dead or gone out. They're all standing up with their heads thrown back. I told you from the back, jumped on top of people's heads, just calmly crawled over the top of them and jumped down to the front. He was trying to pull people into the space at the front. As the police began to ease the pressure from the back, the people that were leaning were still standing up had slumped down. The warning was still going on, I could still hear gunfire. I was out and at the hospital before the all clear went. As the people were dropping around me, I was still on my feet and I thought some I might be able to get some life into the kiddies. I had the baby in my arms and Tony was at my side. My wife fainted, but she came through. I threw the baby over to a policeman. I tried to drag the boy up. The people fell around him. He was up to his neck in bodies. I just pulled them to one side. My legs were still jammed, but I got him up and handed him to someone. I was yelling and shouting to make myself heard. The rescue was going on, but I was only thinking of them and my wife. I managed eventually to get my legs out and walked over these dead people, got my wife outside. There was a lot of people lying on the floor. I tried some artificial respiration on the kiddies, but it was no good. I went with the baby, ahead of the wife and other son. The guns went off when we were near the top of the steps. I held the baby up in the air for about half an hour, crushed and unable to breathe. All the people around me seemed to have fainted, but they were all dead. When we got released, we were able to walk out. My wife and other son died. I went to see a welfare officer to ask how to look after a child on my own and was told to leave him with Dr Bernardo's. The entrance to the shelter has been altered to include a covered way leading to the stairs. This will permit adequate lighting of the stairs and of the approach to them. The stairs have been divided into lanes by handrails and direct pressure into the covered way is controlled and prevented by a crush barrier. No forethought in the matter of structural design or practicable police supervision can be any real safeguard against the effects of a loss of self-control by a crowd. The surest protection must always be that of self-control and practical common sense. I am, sir, your obedient servant, L. R. Dunn. 23rd of March, 1943. And they covered it up. They reworded the report and they covered their own backs. The town clerk had been asking again and again to have the shelter looked at and made safe. They kept being told it was fine as it was and civil defence weren't going to give them any money. The inquiry said they should have kept asking. How many times do you have to ask? Anything that they could do, any little matter that they could twist, they did it to blame the very people that knew what was going to happen. When the council said they would go public, they were told that if they did, they'd be prosecuted for breaking the Official Secrets Act. People started bringing compensation claims against the council and they won all of them. Quietly, the government gave the money back to the council, all kept under wraps that no one who was actually responsible for it was seen to be. The mayor, Mrs Bridger, had people shouting, you cow, at her in the streets. People were calling members of the council murderers and there was sod all that they could do about it. They were stitched up and hung out to dry. If you ever mention my sister's name to my mother, tears are coming to her eyes. My mother died in 1983 and her wardrobe was the coat my sister Iris was wearing the night she lost her life. 
When I relive it, I can still hear the groans of the people dying and they're calling for their mothers and they're gradually getting less and less and quieter and quieter. Everybody should know what happened there. When my son was little, I was at work and my mum was at home looking after him. One day she took him to the local playgroup and said to the play leader, can I stay with my grandson today? And she said, yeah, of course you can. And my mum said, only this is the anniversary of when my nephew died and he's the same age as my grandson and I just can't leave him. It's something terrible that happened there. I think it's very important to have a remembrance of them. I think it's good to stop. Stop and think and remember. It's a terrible thing, war.